Hello and welcome to SciShow Talk Show that day on SciShow where we talk to interesting people about interesting stuff that's being done here in Missoula, Montana and in the world. And today we have Haley Hansen from Ecology Project International, which is a very cool organization that works with students uh, and also with researchers getting good research done all across the world. Exactly. Which Thanks is for having me. which is fantastic. So tell me a little bit about what Ecology Project International does. Right. So um, the basis of Ecology Project International, and I'll likely call it EPI for yeah, short. Yeah, I almost did um, that too. It's, it's a already. mouthful. Um, yeah. But so our goal is to increase environmental literacy through partnering students, typically high school students, with wildlife biologists that are in the field doing ongoing research, um, collecting data. And so we'll, we'll find a group of students that's, in, that's interested in traveling. Um, and then we'll partner them with the wildlife biologists that are in the field doing ongoing long-term research projects, teach the students how to collect the data. And then they get to work um, between 9 and 12 days, depending on where they go, uh, and collect data and um, also create their own research project that they can then bring back um, home. Awesome. Um, so I imagine that the, the challenge is here as you sort of uh, figure, like, first you've got the challenge of uh, finding students to, I, I assume, pay you uh, so that you can have budget and stuff. But also, I, I, like, finding the researchers who, who are not terrified of high school students. Right. Right, and you know, those first couple of years, um, we, we've been around for, we're coming up on 15 years, and those first couple of years, it was a bit of a challenge to find yeah. researchers that were interested in having students come to the field. You know, a lot of them indicated that they were nervous about having students come, mm -hmm. you know, botch the research or, or even, you know, um, go back and tell family members where they might be able to find sea turtle eggs for harvesting. Right. You know, and 15 years later, we have found that uh, the researchers are actually loving to have us come. They're, we, we're being approached all the time by new research organizations and conservation organizations that want us to bring our students where they are working. It really broadens the um, the body of, of knowledge for the yeah. researchers that we're working it with. Increases the amount of science that can be done. Right. That's a lot of bodies on a beach. Yeah. So you started with sea turtles? We did. We started in Costa Rica in 2000, working with local students there. Um, mm -hmm. And the research that we conduct in Costa Rica is on leatherback sea turtles, which are a critically endangered species. They're also the largest reptile. And so what we're doing there, um, we work at a number of different beaches, uh, mainly at Pacuare Nature Reserve, which is touted as the fourth most important nesting beach to leatherback sea turtles. Um, it's on the Caribbean coast of Costa Rica. And, um, and so their nesting season is from about March until August, and they come up and nest at night. Mm -hmm. And so the research that we're doing um, is finding these nesting mothers um, as they're coming up to lay their eggs. And then um, we will sometimes collect and transfer the eggs into a more safe location. There's a couple of reserves that um, can kind of give them a little more um, of a safe haven. So you just get right up in there. We You're get like, right up in there. And so we kind of... Like as they're being laid. You yep. don't like dig them back up. Nope, nope. And so when we do come upon a nesting sea turtle, then everybody kind of sits and waits back and we indicate, you know, at what stage of her nesting we encountered her. And then once she starts to lay her eggs, then we really get in there um, and we measure carapace length and width. Um, we don't do any kind of weights, you can imagine, because <laughs> they're huge. Done. And we look for tags it's super exciting when we find one that doesn't have a tag because that mm. means that it's likely the first time that this female has come up to nest. So that's always fabulous news. Mm -hmm. um, and then when she starts to lay our eggs, we'll get right up under that cloaca and we have one student collecting the eggs and calling out the, the numbers of eggs that are coming out. <laughs> they typically lay two different kinds of eggs. Um, one that's big, maybe about the size of a racquetball, huh. and then many others that are this kind of odd shaped and they're infertile. And so that's one of the cool things that's huh. kind of not perfectly known in the science world yeah. um, as to what the exact use of these little infertile eggs are. And so, huh. um, but they're kind of intermixed in there. 
And so if, if she's laid in a place where we determine probably isn't um, a great place for this nest to be, then we'll transport them and the students learn how to dig an exact replica of the nest and so we'll take a measurement and then they run back up to the reserve and dig the exact nest and put them in there exactly the way that they were laid originally. Hmm. And um, then we mark it and 60 days later we get to go back and uh, excavate the nest um, after they have supposedly hatched. If they haven't hatched, then we're able to um, go through. We, we open up every egg that hasn't hatched. Sometimes that is a pretty disgusting yeah, process. Yeah, that doesn't sound like fun. And so we mark it what stage of the embryonic development yeah. um, that, that they ended up dying. Um, but then there are some times when we'll excavate a nest and most, most of the, the turtles have hatched, but we'll find one or two at the bottom that mm -hmm. have hatched but weren't didn't hatch didn't in time out. to come up and in the mass excavation. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll, we're able to just kind of revive them <laughs> and help them Get back them on down their to way. the ocean. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the, the nicest outcome <clears throat> yeah, of the ones available. It's pretty amazing. You have you accomplish a lot of different things at the same time. You get mm -hmm. to make research less expensive. You get to like help students from America to like practice science mm -hmm. on the ground. You get to subsidize local populations to, you know, maybe get more invested in the ecology of their area, and also ha help like teach them about science. Like, there's a lot going on all at the same time here. Absolutely, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and engaging the local populations is definitely the, our main focus. You know, we end up working in these incredible locations like the Sea of Cortez, mm. um, and we work with local students there that are in high school and tell us that they've never put their face under the water mm. in the Sea of Cortez. And so we take them out on these snorkel census, and they're able to see for the first time all this incredible wildlife and marine life that's happening right off the coast of their own town, which to most people around the world, this is a, a destination. Right. Um, and it's it's giving them a chance to really realize what an incredible place and, and ecosystem that they're living in. That's awesome. So is there a, in, in addition to the sort of scientific goals, or I assume there's also a sort of conservation goals? Absolutely. Um, you know, most of the, the places that we work are have been indicated as, you know, biodiversity hotspots like Costa Rica. Um, the leatherback sea turtle is a critically endangered animal. And, um, you know, we're seeing just really incredible results from our students being in the field. Uh, for example, uh, in Costa Rica, when we first started working at Pacuata Nature Reserve, um, they estimated that about 98% of the nests that were um, laid were being predated by either humans or animals um, or, or being destroyed for one reason or, or another. And this last year, um, 15 years later, that number uh, decreased to 2%. Well, that's great. That is so fantastic. That yep. is really cool work. Well, I have a treat for you. Um, I don't even know what it's going to be yet, but Jesse from Animal Wonders is going to share with us a treat. Jesse, you brought us a really weird snake. <laughs> <laughs> she is kind of weird looking. Her name is Serpentina, Tina for short. Hi, Tina. You Hi. can hold her if you'd like. Okay. <laughs> she is a rubber boa, and these guys are just, I love these snakes. And actually, put your fingers like kind of apart a little bit. Okay, so that she can. And we'll do like a. All right. Whoosh. Harder to drop this way. Wow, you are weird. You're very cold. Yeah, sorry, cold. So, cold. so it's, you know, it's. Yeah, it's cold in chiller, here. Chillier yeah. in here. She's going to be that temperature. Um, have you ever seen a rubber boa? No, I don't think so. Have you ever seen a rubber boa? I have. In the wild? I have seen one in the wild. Congratulations, oh, wow. they're, they're really hard to find because they're nocturnal and they like to burrow. And they're pretty short, they're not huge. Mm -hmm. Very secretive. I really find rubber boas fascinating because, because they're so secretive and they also, they look weird. They You're look right. weird. You have like strange little, this nubby tail. Yeah. and It's like you've got two heads. Yeah. I love how you said that. They're nicknamed the two-headed snake. <laughs> <laughs> Is that so that when someone's trying to eat its head, it accidentally eats its tail? Yeah. Well, not necessarily accidentally. They try and make animals go after their tail. So right. They, they actually have fused vertebrae in their tail, so it's extra hard. Huh. And if they're threatened by something, they will roll up into a ball and stick their head on the inside of their ball body, and then they'll stick their tail up huh. and do little fake strikes <sighs> with their tail. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you with my stubby tail. Well, they're pretty small, so that's yeah, not going to no. work with 
every predator their predators and be like, I'm just going to eat you in bite, one bite. Mm -hmm. um, so then they have a, a backup system. So if, if something does try to eat them and they will open their cloaca, their mint, and they will musk oh, stinky really? poopy stuff. Neat. And then they'll squirm around and slither around all over themselves. So they cover their body in that. And not only does it stink really bad, it also tastes terrible. Yeah. So whatever tries to eat it, they'll spit I can out. believe that. Yeah. Don't want to eat poop and pee. No. I'm not, I'm not into that. <laughs> um, it's squeezing me. Yeah. It's so giving she, my fingers little squeezes. She's a rubber boa, so she is yeah. part of the boa. Constrictor. Family. Yep. And so she constricts things. What, what are you big enough to constrict? She doesn't like eat things those? that are going to run away from her. These guys don't strike. They just okay. they don't strike, so they're not going to you know, be an ambush predator and wait and wait and wait and then go ahead and strike. No. Most snakes do that. Yeah. These guys eat babies. So oh, they'll go burrow yeah, down babies. into like a, a vole or a shrew yeah. nest mm -hmm. down underneath and they will just eat the babies, well, you know, so they're up to them and just eat them. Are you saying that the snakes <laughs> diet is entirely babies? Babies. Real, just 100% babies. <laughs> babies. It has no other source of food. Well, if the thing isn't moving around, I mean, if maybe if it's a sick, very small, and sick, it would go after it. But it Something doesn't, that's not, that's but, not gonna run away. They're, wow. they're, 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 like, they're very docile, and I love her face. Her eyes are tiny yeah. compared to other oh, snakes. I think she just has a really sweet, she's almost smiling. <laughs> she does have a little smile. She must be thinking about eating babies. Eating <laughs> babies. <laughs> it's the only thing that makes me happy. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's nocturnal animals usually have larger eyes. They can. Well, they usually have a heightened sense of some sort. Right. So either they have larger ears or larger nose or larger eyes. Okay. Usually. That's mm -hmm. what they're going for. But So the eyes maybe just aren't a big deal. Well, she's, she burrows, so she's going to yeah. be down on the ground. She's not going to use them for a lot of things. She's mm -hmm. mostly going to use her, her sense of smell, her tongue, and she's just going to seek out mm -hmm. babies. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's how it's the circle of life. She's a baby herself. Is she? Yeah. Well, babies can beat up on babies. How old is she? Well, she's three. Yeah, that's not a baby. Well, she can live to be 30. Right. I guess that's pretty, that's pretty young. Kind of then. a baby. I don't know. I feel like child. I feel like snakes don't have a very long period of being uh, being non-adults. No, that's like true. That's yeah. true. It takes about two years for them to mature. Yeah. So she's just just over maturity. Yeah. I was trying. I was trying to stick up for her. Yeah. Good. Good try. <laughs> <laughs> Tina, thank you for coming to visit us here on SciShow Talk Show. Jesse, thank you for bringing Tina in. Thank you for having us. Um, and tell us where we can learn more about. EPI. Absolutely. We go to our website, uh, www.ecologyproject.org, um, and we've got lots of room for lots of students, so we'd love to have everybody join us. And if you want to see more of what Jessie is up to, you can go to youtube.com slash animalwondersmontana. We're producing a new show with her. It's awesome, and I love it. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us here on SciShow Talk Show this wonderful day. It's been a very fun time. If you want to subscribe so you can keep learning more with us here at SciShow, you can go to youtube.com slash SciShow. There's a subscribe button there.